after discussing in the previous section uh, several case studies, as I mentioned in the notes posted on Canvas, we're moving on to a new section, but we will still use those case studies. We will still talk or give examples from the US, UK, Germany and France. And that's very important, therefore, for you to understand those case studies that we have discussed and to continue to use them, including the textbook sections that have been posted on Canvas. Um, so, what we'll do next in this, in this section is to move on to talk about how policy is made and implemented in modern political systems, how the modern state accomplishes its, its functions. Uh, and also about how you can play a role in it, especially through elections and uh, political parties. But that's, that's the next, uh, those are the next steps. So for now, therefore, let's try to remember what is the modern state um, purpose, right? Think Locke, think Hobbes. So the modern state, first of all, and I mentioned this before, needs to provide or does provide some basic things. And your book goes through several functions of the modern state, but I emphasize two, and we talked about this briefly, right? Two that are actually can be synthesized into one word, security. And this security can be, uh, you know, physical security, which is law and order, protection of borders, and so on, uh, or economic security, which is simply providing the, the, the means for the people to live, uh, for you to have a uh, a daily life, to have a job, to, to survive, to eat, right? So, physical security, this can be law and order, health, you know, basically pro uh, uh, providing the basic health infrastructure, as I mean, you know, health insurance and whatever, uh, defending the borders, the, the biological survival, right? And economic, also related to that, obviously, but all the necessary things, you know, managing the economy. Through which policies and in what, what matters is different. But once a state fails to provide these, that's when it's, it's a failed state, and that's where people, uh, the population revolts, right? Revolutions, you know, sometimes, I mean, the, the straw that breaks the camel's back is this, is this. I mean, even an oppressive regime, a regime that is not democratic, will provide this, and, and as long as it does that, it, it maintains the legitimacy. People sort of feel and expect from the government to to, to provide at least, you know, the conditions for life, basically. So that's security. So security that can be physical and economic. And these are the major duties of, a mod of the modern state. Of the modern state, by that I mean, obviously, the modern, all this set of institutions that govern a territory and a membership. This is why we have a modern state, because this is why we, ke we keep it, right? Uh, because we expect it to perform these, uh, these duties, which the previous state states, you know, in the Middle Ages, well, to a degree, right? Because in order to provide these, you need to have an entire set of, an entire machinery that provides this, and we'll talk about that machinery. Uh, <clears throat> now, we also, uh, in order for governments to be legitimate, right, that set of institutions that actually rule over a territory and membership, in order for governments to be legitimate, we also expect them to be democratic, right? So democracy, we should understand this more or less, we'll talk about the very varieties of democracies, but, you know, uh, representation, rights, protections of, of human rights, and so on. We'll talk more in more detail in the next section about that, when we talk about democracies and non-democratic systems. But this is kind of also sort of an expectation for legitimate government somewhere in the background. But the basic functions of a state, of the modern state, are these. And when it's, because when it starts accomplishing this, then it's no longer uh, a state, really, no longer a modern state. And again, we kind of also expect democracy, uh, mostly representation, right? representative democracy, which is elections, but that's, that's sort of an added bonus. This is at the backbone. Now, I mentioned a, a key word uh, here, and I want you to understand it. Uh, the word is uh, policy. So what is policy? So we will start from, because we're talking about democratic political systems, we'll look at both of this, you know, the demands of providing security and then of uh, what I call democracy. And your book, again, talks about the, the, the functions of the state, 
uh, in, a, in a different chapter when we talked about briefly and you read that chapter and it's more expansive but I think that it's, it's easier to understand when you think of these two major elements of what we expect from a democratic state because it can be very democratic like the Weimar Republic in Germany between the two wars but if it didn't provide economic security remember my example with huge inflation and, and rolling barrels of money to buy bread that was a complete breakdown, and what came after that? Hitler, right? Uh, so it really did. So you see, one way or the other doesn't doesn't work. Doesn't work. Uh, I mean, you can you can have a state that provides security and it's not democratic, and it will survive more than a democratic state that doesn't provide security. It's, it's that simple. People want to live first and foremost. So, I mentioned policy, right? And we'll look at these case studies of democratic systems, next section, some undemocratic systems. But what is policy? Well, let's, let's back off, uh, let's back off from this discussion for a second and remember how we depicted uh, the state, right? Um, and a democratic state, right? right? We depicted it as having these essential things, which uh, Locke has mentioned as well, right? A democratic political system in a modern state is based on the idea that the people govern themselves through their representatives, so representative democracy. So we have a legislative branch which will make the rules and an executive branch which will implement those rules. Right? And this process is what? It's policy. What, is, what are policies? Policies are ideas that become reality. That's the simplest way to explain it. And you're going to say, well, that's, that's vague. But you see how difficult it is for entire society. Because these are ideas that become reality for the entire society. And this is the essence of representation, as we'll see. Right? In, a, in, a political, in a democratic political system, we have a legislature separate from an executive. But you have a legislature mostly because we want, the idea is that people govern themselves. But which people, right? You have different people with different uh, uh, ideas, right? So who's going to get to decide how we live together, right? People governing themselves. And this is why we send representatives that represent those different ideas in the society into the legislature, where these people then debate these ideas, right? And it is through this process of debate that then laws are made. And what is law? Law is that is a definition of a policy, basically. Right? Laws are rules that will govern the life of people who have sent their representatives to make rules for them. Right? The people send representatives to make rule for these same people. That's what means you know law making. Laws are rules. That's what they are. And because there are different opinions in a democratic political system, this is why we say democracy, all these voices, well, many of these voices will be heard in theory, right, in theory. And the difference is that uh, on, uh, instead of fighting it out here, and different opinions being fought out here in the population, basically on the streets, you send people in a very clearly uh, organized institution, which is the legislature, where the rules are very strict. And it is, according to these set rules, it's like a game. It's like a game, it's like a football game, like a basketball game, like a soccer game. Those 11 versus 11 in soccer, for example, right? They will fight it out, representing different teams who represent different cities, but they will fight it out according to a set of rules. This is why it's non-violent, although it's physical. Right? The same here, right? Because, as I mentioned before, to, in a society, there are different opinions. Conflicts are inevitable, which means different, th different opinions, ways of life, uh, ideas about what's right and wrong. That is inevitable in a society. Even if two people are there, it's still inevitable. This is why, you know, um, uh, we, there was one of, one of you mentioned freedom versus unity, right? There's no unity in a society, because there are different opinions, right? Well, in order to survive together and still apply this principle of, well, we have to govern each other. Well, who? Well, I should govern you because I know better. Right? You're, say, you're going to say, no, no, I should govern you because I know better. So that's, that's why 
That's why these differences of opinion will never go away, because we're different. Ask your, your colleague, ask your brother, ask your mother about anything, right? And in many things you'll see, well, we have a diff you are, we like different kinds of ice cream. We think it's gonna, we should go in a different direction. We, should, we think we should go in a different way in a different direction. Everybody wants wealth, but how should this be spread in the society? How should, make, how should we govern the economy? These are complicated questions, and first of all, I'm not sure there is an answer to, for example, how to govern the economy, right? But there are different opinions, and opinions that are just, you know, whims, different plans. But in order to be able to have, you know, coherence in a society, you need to reach one conclusion, and that is the role of the legislature. The role of the legislature is to have all these different opinions represented, and then let, let them fight it out. But fight it out according to rules, which means that it's peaceful. <laughs> and we all accept the, the laws. Why? Well, first of all, there are instruments that the state make, uh, with which the state makes us, uh, the executive ma makes us uh, accept the, these rules. But on the other hand, we accept them because we, well, they were reached according to the rules. There was a, a vote here. And what is the vote? Vote is these different representatives saying for or against. And we count them up and we say, well, the majority, which is 50% plus 1, that's majority. Differentiate between majority and plurality, and that's the same thing. We're going to talk about this when we talk about electoral systems. So a majority, 50% plus 1, of these people here, of representatives, have decided, so let's, then it's law. Well, why? Why not, you know, uh, how about the other 49%? But we need to reach a conclusion, that's why. And certain laws are, demand a larger majority, two-thirds, maybe 60%, 66%, and so on, depending on how important it is to pass an amendment to the Constitution, which is the DNA of the entire system, of the political system, where you need larger majorities, not simple, not simple majorities of 50%, plus one, and so on, and so on. So that's the role of the legislature. But the legislature pass, you know, is a place where these things clash and... Uh, a decision is, is reached, and that's lawmaking. You know? <clears throat> so all these ideas come in, so to speak, are debated, and then one idea is set, and that's the law. Right? That's the definition of the new rule of how we, should, we will live together. But that's not enough. I can pass a, a rule right now. I'm saying from now on, all of you who are watching this video are going to sit, stand on one foot one hour a day. I just passed this rule. I'm sorry, you have to do it. And you're going to say, well, how can you make it? Make me. Indeed. So that's why the legislature has one function. This is why you have the executive. Okay? The executive is the, well, the name can imply many things, but it can also imply just executing. Right? And in systems, the that are characterized by, by a separation of powers as the U.S., you see that you, the legislature legislates, and the executive constitutionally executes. Executes, actually. The executive cannot, cannot pass laws. Because it's a, it's a very powerful instrument that you want to separate from, uh, from, from this one, to a degree. So what does the executive do? So it, it will have to make these laws reality. A, a, a word, a wording, a sentence is uh, emitted by this institution, but how will that become reality? Because they can publish a law and they're not going to care unless there's a set of institutions that will make sure that the people here live according to those rules. And those are the institutions of the executive. So let's look at each of these branches one uh, by one. The legislature and the executive. And then we move on into the uh, administration of bureaucracy, which is the, the whole apparatus. It is the whole set of organizations with which the executive does its job. So that's going to be the next. And then we'll talk briefly about the judiciary, which is the branch that settles conflicts within the system. But for now, keep in mind this structure, because this is how the state provides this security, but also democracy. So legislatures, sorry, legislatures or the legislature, right? So what
what is uh, the function of the legislature? In a modern state that is also democratic, there are three functions of the legislature. One is to represent the citizens. The other one is to well, legislate, which is lawmaking. The third one is oversight. And we'll look at each of them. So obviously the first one, the most essential one for a modern democratic, modern state that is a democratic system, right, is representation. And we already talked about this, right? People are represented. How? In, in what ways and whatever, but that's, that's, some, that's a different discussion, right? But the idea that people send representatives who then represent their ideas, more or less, and then they decide. So here are many questions, right? These representatives, how many do we send? And how do we decide who, uh, who gets there? And what is the ratio? And, uh, you know, do we send groups? Or do we send one person? And, and that's what the elections do. And there are many types of, you know, transforming 100 million people here into 100 people here. Right? Who gets to represent what and what do they represent? So it's a complex thing because this legislature is meant to represent the... Many things. They represent the people who elected them stay in this region. This Jim here and Bob both come from this region. They're both elected by this region. They have to represent this region. But who do they represent in that region? Well, they represent those who elected them, which is, I don't know, maybe a majority, maybe a plurality. Because, you know, obviously not 100% of these people voted for them. For them. Right? But they're supposed to represent those who voted for them from the district. Uh, they, uh, they are meant to represent the entire district, the interests of the district, but they are members in the legislature of the country. So they, they are they're meant to represent the country. But hey, wait a minute, when the people voted for them, they also voted for a party, which is what? It's, it's an organization, as we'll see a little bit later in this section, that represents a set of ideas. So I vote for Jim because Jim is, stands for certain ideas. So, you know, he also represents the party and is a member of that party, of that set of ideas, right? Of, of an organization that stands for a set of ideas, which are, you know, separate from, you know, the interests of the district, the interests of those who voted for you, the interests of the country. I mean, there's it's a set of ideas about how to live. So any representative represents many things. Plus, the representative also represents him or herself, right? Because there's also a leadership function of the... Of the representative you know I'm gonna make good laws because I know how to do it and I'm gonna you're gonna I'm asking for your vote because you have to trust me as a leader so the the other you know you representing the people who elected you in the district the district itself um, the country or as the country's interest the party but also my own ideas as leader you know trust me hope and change right that's the idea right trust me so all these things, and they can conflict. It's not very simple, right? Sometimes the interests of the state, of the entire country, conflict with the interests of the district. We should lower tax. We should lower um, tariffs. You know that the, the taxes that we put on imports on certain goods because it's good for the country, but it's not good for the district because in my district I have a factory that does produces the exam, exact same things, and if I lower the tariffs on imports, it's going to hurt the factories in my district. So what do I do? My ideology, my party tells me to that the best for the economy is, I don't know, spending less. However, in my, in my district I have many, many people who are poor or many people who, who uh, let's say farmers, who need uh, subsidies, who need uh, money from the state. Well, that conflicts, that conflicts, because on the one hand people here are clamoring for support, but my party tells me not to give support. So what do I do? Right? Or not direct support, right? So what do I do? So this is not simple. The second thing is the uh, duty of the legislature is to well legislate, lawmaking. And that's the process. Uh, th there are several aspects here, uh, but one is, you know, making the laws, which is debate, you know, negotiation, clash of ideas, clash of interests, all these things. So this is a process in which these are 100 people need to negotiate with each other, to play by the rules of the institutions, and each institution has a different set of rules, 
in, in, for example, House of Representatives in Congress versus Senate versus House of Commons in, in the UK versus National Assembly in France. They're different rules. So you have to know the rules, play them well, to, to get the law made that maybe you want, maybe your party wants, maybe your district wants, maybe the nation needs, whatever, whatever the nation is state. Who knows, right, why you're doing it. Or maybe you just have your own interest, you, you have a lobbyist who, who has been supporting you and you want to, you know, give him a perk. That too. So, making laws, which is through debate, negotiation, rules, right, all these things. And then passing laws. Passing laws, right, legislative enactment. So you need to make sure that you write a, you know, a law, first of all, so you have to introduce a bill, which is the draft of a law, right? So bills are drafts of laws, right? Yeah. So, and then passing the law means that you need to make sure that you get the majority. And in a two-party system, you kind of know which party has the majority, but when there are many parties and some independents, how do you get the majority? And again, the process of negotiation. To get what? A majority to vote for it so that this bill, this idea, becomes law. So that's, that's the, the legislation. It's based, it, it's a very intricate and fascinating process. And, you know, some of the best legislatures are those who know the rules. Because those who know the rules can also use them the best. And the third, uh, one of the important parts here in legislature, just, just to mention, um, is because the legislature passes laws, right? But the important part in, the, in, in this is the power of passing laws regarding money. So that's the so-called uh, power of the purse. And that's one of the key powers of the legislature. And if you want to know how powerful the legislature is, ask that legislature, ask yourself, read up on does it control, how much control it has over the budget. The budget meaning the money that the government can spend. Uh, and if a, if a legislature has the power over money, then the executive is at its disposal to a, to a large degree. Because once you cut money, nothing works. Right? For anything to work, you need money. You need to pay people who, to do things. You need to buy things. You need to have buildings. You, need, you know, when you had the government shutdowns in the US, right, a few years ago, <coughs> and then in the 90s, it was simply because the budget was not passed. This, the legislature decided not to give money, and literally there's no way for anyone to do anything because no one is paying. So the power of the purse is key, and always ask yourself how much power does the legislature have over the purse. So that's uh, part of the legislative power. And finally, oversight. Well, oversight is the power to control the other branch, which is the executive. That's oversight. To control how it, and this control can be, can be uh, broken down into many things. Oversight can be powers of appointment. As in the UK, you saw that it is the parliament that actually creates the executive. So the parliament creates the executive and can remove the executive. The same in Germany, because this is why they're parliamentary systems, because all the power is with the parliament, with the legislature. So it approves the chancellors. I mean, it actually creates the chancellor through a majority. It creates the prime minister through a majority in, in Britain and so on. And also, they can remove the prime minister. So, appointment of the head executive, right? But also removal of the head of executive. Plus and minus. Right? And we mentioned the tool that was the motion of censure. Right? Censure or the motion of no confidence. And these are tools for the, for the legislature to remove. And this, uh, this also applies to, uh, to France. In France, the prime minister can actually be removed by the, by the parliament and also by the president, but that's a different story, right? Um, so, motion of censure, C-E-N-S-U-R-E, -E, motion of no confidence. Appointing and remo removing the head of the executive is very important. Also, uh, appointment of or approving appointments made by the head of the executive. For example, in the in the US, which is a different system, right? Again, 
continue ref referring to those case studies. So in the US, you have a separate branch, which is the executive led by the president. The, 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 the Congress, the, this, the presidential system, does not have a choice in approve, uh, appointing or removing the, the executive. It's a different system, right? But it still has oversight. And it has oversight through approval of every other appointment. So the Congress does not elect the president. The president is directly elected. This is why it's a presidential system. However, oversight happens also through approving appointments made by the president. All the members of the cabinet, secretaries of different departments, members of the Supreme Court, judges, all, all major appointments made by the president need to be approved by the Congress, by the Senate, actually. So approving appointments to the executive is, is a part of uh, oversight. So through so one thing was appointment, appointment either of the head of the executive or um, other positions in the executive. Then, uh, it can, scrutiny is another thing, which means examining how the executive does his job. And that's, that is key to any democratic political system, including in the US. This is why the Congress, for example, in the US has committees that examine different agencies of the executive, and, and in the UK, you have the House of Commons <coughs> calling the Prime Minister uh, to testify, the ministers to testify, and, and, and even, so, scrutiny of the executive, but also of the bureaucracy. And we're going to talk about the bureaucracy, or the administration. All the people that the executive hires, that run the country, right? So, the, the, the legislature calls them in, saying, hey, uh, cabinet, uh, you know, Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services, come and testify in front of this committee in, the, in, in Congress. Or, hey, um, um, Prime Minister Cameron, come and testify in front of the, well, actually, Cameron goes there every week, uh, the Prime Minister of uh, the United Kingdom. Or, hey, Chancellor, right? So, uh, having the, the power to call them to to, to, to task, uh, or maybe form institutions, form commissions that inquire into various things. In the U.S. Congress, you have the committee, uh, a committee that was formed to inquire into the Benghazi incident uh, of a couple of years ago. So that's still there, right? So you can this function of scrutiny of seeing how the executive runs the country is key for democracy because remember these are the people who represent, right? Right? Who represent. The, the people, the population, the, the citizens, and they need to be able to check the government. Um, and finally, I mentioned this power of oversight is right appointment, scrutiny, and approval. Certain decisions by every executive has the power, even in, 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 uh, in, in uh, political systems that are very different from the, from, um, um, the U.S. or in the U.S. Uh, they, there is the power of the executive to emit rules. Because the executive governs the country in, on a day-to-day -day basis, they also make rules. Even a very minor rule is how, how long should... Uh, uh, you know, um, how many resources will you give the FBI to do whatever shapes the life of the country, right? How many resources do I give the Supreme Court or to the judges or whatever? Every internal rule of the executive, my point, although the judiciary is not part of the executive, but any internal rule of the executive, how long should these offices be open, right? Will shape your life because it, con it does control the life of the population. So an internal rule that is in its power to make will have huge impact. Well, this is why sometimes, either through scrutiny or specific approval, the legislature will have to approve some of these things. Some things, they don't have any say. These internal rules, Congress, for example, in the US doesn't have any say. But in other uh, political systems like the UK or France, um, France is a good example. In France, the president, who is the head of the executive, right, can actually pass decrees. And decrees don't are, have the power of law, but they don't go through the legislature. That's a weird thing, right? 
But remember, there the president is directly elected. Um, and however, the, if eventually, the legislature will have to approve or refuse those decrees. So those decrees are temporary. But this approval of policy decisions by the executive is also another way to do oversight. <clears throat> So that's the legislature. Now let's talk about the executive. What does the executive do? The idea is for you to understand these, uh, these major uh, differences of, of roles and so on. So the executive has four major uh, functions. And, and let's just look at the composition. In the executive, right, the... Uh, the group of uh, institutions, which is the set of institutions that govern the country on a day-to-day -day basis, right? That run it, you know? Uh, apply the rules, right? Execute the rules and make sure they work every day. So there are a few positions. There is a head of executive position of some sort. So let's let this done here. So head or leader of the executive, right? Then there is usually a cabinet, which is all the top people in the executive. And then there's the administration. Or bureaucracy, who are all the people who execute these things on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's a head or heads, right? Then there's a cabinet who are the people, the top people in each of these institutions that compose the executive, and then there's the administration. You see how this works. Um, so the, for example, uh, let's say this is I don't know whichever country. Right? There is a head of the executive who is in charge with the whole structure. Let's just put an age here. There is a cabinet with different institutions dealing with different areas. And then there is the administration. Let me give you an example. For example, in the UK, you have the head is called what? The Prime Minister. Then you have ministers. And each minister is in charge with a different area. Health and human health. Right? Then you have interior, which is police, <clears throat> then you have foreign affairs, then you have economy, then you have uh, education, economy, education, whatever. So areas of life, because that's what happens, the government governs your life. In a democracy, you say, well, I govern my life because I send those representatives, they make laws and all this, all this thing, that's in a democracy, right? But the government, what it does, it governs your life, it runs your life, because those rules need to be implemented. What does it mean? Policy needs to be implemented. This is, a, this is a step from, you know, I mentioned, you know, idea to reality. That's, that's a policy. But ideas, you know, what are ideas? Bills, drafts of a law, that become rule, which is a law, right? And then the rules need to become reality. And the, the, the step from, here's the, let's say this is the representative, the legislature, has passed the law, sends it to the executive to execute it. And how does it do? Well, the prime minister or the president, whatever it is, right, will say, well, from now on, it shall be like this. Well, it doesn't matter if he, he she says that. that. That doesn't make you reality. The reality means that there's a set of institutions that apply those rules day after day. And, for example, let's say um, health, or let's say economy, whichever you want to, to do. The point is that you have a set of people, which is a state administration, that covers the entire country. This is what means that the set of institutions in power over a territory of membership. This is, the, this is how the definition of the state works. And this is why the formation of the modern state was actually a formation of the modern bureaucracy, which was centralized in the hands of the government. And what is the bureaucracy? The bureaucracy is basically a set of Institutions. And what is an institution? Keyword. An institution is a group of people who follow the same goals according to common rules, right? Pursue the same goals according to common rules with constancy in time. A group of people who do the same thing with the same goals day after day after day. This is why the police is an institution, the post office is an institution, this university is an institution. Because 
We show up day after day and we know what the task is because our roles are very neatly defined. This is what makes it an institution. The whole institution has one purpose, education, hopefully, right? And each individual plays a role in that, but that role is oriented towards a very clear set of goals. And doing it, it day after day after day is what creates this institution. If, if there wouldn't be this set of rules and the people who, who follow them day after day, this would be an empty building. Just a building, which makes it into a university, hopefully, right? An institution of higher education, is that there is a set of people doing this day after day. The same with the post office, right? There, the post office is the whole communication of things from one place to the other. It functions because there's a set of people throughout the country which do a certain set of actions towards certain goals day after day after day. And that makes it work. The world doesn't work of its own. Nothing works of its own. And this is why an institution is a set of a group of people pursuing the same goals, following the same rules, um, day after day after day, with continuation in time. And this can be, they can be very formal institutions, like, you know, the rules are very clearly set and written down, and there's a set of charter or whatever, but it's going to be very informal, because your group of, your group of friends who <coughs> play, um, softball every week and then go for beers or, or bowling and then go for, for, for pizza or whatever, that can be an institution because institutions shape your life. Nothing changes without institutions, informal or formal. That the fact that we get together and do something on an ongoing basis is, you know, it's, it, it, it's an institution, an informal institution. And that's what changes your life because it's rules that create order. Remember our political philosophy discussion, creation of order. Well, order is created in a society by institutions. You yourself, you don't change anything. But it's a set of, a group of people who do it together, which changes how things are done, right? How things are done in certain areas. This is why you have the police, which is the same, you, you know, the uniform same, same, serve, serve the same purpose. To distinguish what? Institutions. Nurses, right? Doctors, postmen, whatever. So institutions are key. And this is why bureaucracies are key. And we're going to talk about bureaucracies a little bit later, but understand that a rule is made, a law is passed by the legislature, is set, and then the, ex the executive needs to make it reality. So the rule is from now on, all babies will receive milk, powder, whatever, powder, milk, <coughs> for free. Once a week, let's say. And, well, I can pass that rule to the... I just passed it. Anything is going to happen? No. So, the head of the executive will assign that rule to the specific department that will make sure that this happens. Which means that an order will be emitted throughout the system telling each worker here that once a week you're going to send a pack of powdered milk to every single child. That's a very basic and a brutal example. But understand, so this is why the executive runs the country and how it governs the country. Because it makes things work, makes things happen. And this happening week after week, month after one month has created what? Policy has changed the reality. This is how policy is idea, you know, build to law into reality, and this is policy. And policy is not policy unless, you know, it needs to be passed by lawmaking, but then it needs to be what? Implemented, made reality. And everything, that's how government works in a modern state. Because a modern state is what? A set of institutions controlling exclusively a territory and a population. But it needs this key institution for that to happen. So, briefly then, we're going to talk about the administration next. But briefly about the major roles of the uh, head of the executive, because there are different ways to have a head of the executive. So the major roles of a head of the executive, or heads, are one, leadership. The head of the executive is this, in this unique position that it's only one. Meaning, well, it can be two, but in, in the sense that it's, it's not 100 like the legislature. So that automatically puts the spotlight on the head of the executive and that's the role of leadership, which is leading the whole machinery that I just described 
<coughs> or maybe taking the initiative uh, of this. So the leadership function is taking the initiative in formulating, articulating, implementing uh, policy. Right? It can be simple, simply the leader who, like the Prime Minister in France, who leads the implementation of the policy, but it, this leader can also make policy, write the bill that then goes and is approved, takes the initiative. Right? So leadership in policy making and impl implementation depends on the system. Um, this is why the leader can have a veto power, for example, over legislation, right? refusing to, to sign a law and so on. So why leadership position? Because it's a very unique position in the spotlight. Then, supervision of administration, so I, which I just described. So supervising the functioning of the entire machinery of government. That's at the heart of the role of the head of the executive. Leadership is maybe, yes, maybe not, it depends. But supervising the administration is part of this function of executing, right? of implementing policy. And it's hundreds, thousands, millions of people at the top of whom, of the, who, which pyramid is the head of the executive. Then a special role in military and foreign affairs, because again, of this uniqueness of the head of the executive, that it's one position, and, and, and in the top, of, at the top of a government that governs an entire state, so since there's only one person, who would you send to represent you in, versus other states, right, other states, or to govern the institution, which is the military, that protects the state. So this is why you have a, this is where the uniqueness of the position from which the leadership function comes, is very important because the military needs to have one head, you can't have a hundred unified action, and foreign affairs also needs to have you know one key representative, even if the other institutions and the legislature play an important role. For example, in the US, the president can sign a treaty, the legislature can decide not to pass it, and the, the treaty is dead, right? So, but however, is the president who goes to sign the treaty, even if that might never become reality, you need one guy to do that. Or yeah. And finally, but it's not final, maybe the first, but I wanted to put it last to differentiate, is the symbolic role, symbolic ceremonial role. And this is key, <coughs> because again you need one, per an, uh, one person to represent the state, it's a symbolic representation of the state. Well, guess what? This, all of this, is head of executive. And this is head of state that we talked about. So the head of state is the person who ceremonially, symbolically, represents the ongoing, you know, the entire thing. This is why often the head of state is above politics, separated from politics, not even elected, like the monarch in the UK. This is why the head of state signs laws, because it doesn't do anything with the laws, but gives kind of the stamp of the state on a temporary policy approves it, right? Because the symbolic role is, stands above the daily hustle and bustle of politics and policy, at least theoretically. Now, notice that there are two major roles here, and this is why you have two dip different ways of organizing <coughs> uh, the, the executive. You can have um, these roles distributed in various ways. You can have a Fused executive, where well, should I write this? Fused executive. And the fused executive is when both roles are in one person. And that's what? The US. In the US, president is head of state, ceremonially, symbolically representing the US, and head of government or head of executive, which is running the things. And, and the confusion is that, well, this leads to confusions, right? Because, well, you criticize Obama or Bush, but I criticize the United States, because he stands for the United States in this role. Well, no, I'm criticizing because this was a stupid law. Well, what's the difference? And how about foreign, foreign affairs? What if he takes a, 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 a leadership in a foreign affairs role representing the state, but yet it's a bad policy? So how does this work? 
This is why perhaps it's simpler when these two rows are distributed separately. There's a head of state, clearly just representing above politics, <coughs> symbolic, ceremonial, not involving the daily hustle and bustle and head of executive, and obviously you recognize this is UK, this is Germany. Monarch, Prime Minister in, in <coughs> the UK, President, Chancellor in the Germany. And this is why the Prime Minister is the most powerful person in the executive there, or the Chancellor is more powerful than the quote-unquote President. And this is why I mentioned, don't be confused by the names we give, look at the function they play. It can be big voodoo doctor and large pooba doctor, whatever. Doesn't matter, right? Don't understand what they do and then you understand how the system works. Not words. The president is not more powerful because he's called a president. The president of Germany is very, has very little power because he's only symbolic. Right? So the, the heads of the executive in the US are the president, France, um, um, UK is the prime minister, Germany is the chancellor. But, so this is what? This is <coughs> dual executive. Right? The executive, the two, the two functions of the executive are separated. But then there's a third version in, in the modern democratic political system, which I call dual two. Dual two. And you have guessed, yes, you probably know already, it's the French model, right? Where the one person is head of state, the president, right? And also, broadly speaking, head of executive, head of government. Because it's the president in France who sets the grand directions of policy. He sets the direction in which the country goes. He can, he can even sit in the cabinet meetings and, and whatever. The prime minister, what is the prime minister then? Well, he's also head of the executive too, right? Because he plays a subordinate role. He executes these grand directions of policy, but also runs, you know, he is not a leader, but he, is, he does this. He does partially this. So the president takes this, and to that degree this, why the Prime Minister will probably take this. And that's dual executive, but in a different way. Because here, you have one person playing both roles, this and a good chunk of this, or the most important chunk of that, and the Prime Minister playing a secondary kind of executive role. So, the next thing to do in our discussion will be to move on to see how then policies made and implemented. How are laws passed, and then how do they become reality through the bureaucracy? And that's going to be the next stage, the next uh, uh, parts of our discussion. We also mentioned very briefly the types of legislatures that are around, but the idea is to talk about how policy is made, built to law, and then how it's implemented, what the role, what role the administration, i.e., bureaucracy, machinery. Plays in this whole process. Thank you.